Welcome back to our series on Introductory Statistics. I'm Mark Ledbetter. This is Lecture Video 34. We are in Section 9.1, Part 2. And we are talking about how to test hypothesis for the mean, the population mean, when sigma is known. And that is what we've done and we will continue to do. So I hope you enjoy this pre-recorded video. The rejection region. Now, in this book, we don't use one of the methods, which is completely equivalent, where we get a critical value, all right? So we can compare uh, our test statistic to a critical value and make the same uh, decision. But the book decided that it makes more sense, which it does, to teach the p-value method because that's what computer programs give you. They give you a p-value, and so we need to know how to interpret the p-value. And so the rejection criteria is always the p-value has to be less than alpha. Remember that alpha equals 1 minus c, which is our 1 minus the confidence level. Okay? So if we want to be 95% confident, then 95% confidence level Alpha equals 1 minus 0.95 equals 0.05. So the p-value would have to be less than 0.05 for us to reject the null. So it's called a rejection region, a rejection criteria, a rejection region is another. Let me... So we could have rejection... Nope, does not a not a G, a J. Rejection region, rejection criteria, or critical region. Those are three ways of saying the same thing. I like rejection criteria because then that tells you that if this is true, we reject the null hypothesis. We reject something. Okay. Now, the hardest part of this is how to calculate the p-value. And the p, how to calculate the p-value is determined by our, excuse me, by our alternative hypothesis, H1. So um, now, let me back up just a second. If you notice for our uh, test statistic here, notice that I have mu in the formula, and I have x bar. These are two different things. Two different things. Where do I get my value of mu? Which I don't know. I don't know mu. So how do I put mu in there? Well, I look at my hypothesis statement, and it tells me that mu is equal to 100. So that tells me that I put that in 100, in this case, if mu is equal to 100, whatever this value is here, that's what I'm going to substitute into my test statistics. So my null hypothesis tells me um, what to plug in for my parameter. Okay. Now, we have to know sigma to use this one. We do not. We can just know the sample standard deviation to use the t's test statistic, but mu is in both of them. So I have to have mu, and that comes from my null hypothesis. Okay, mu comes, for what we're doing in this chapter, it will be mu, comes from null hypothesis, or H naught. Okay, now, um, so again, the, the p-value, we're going to use the alternative. The alternative hypothesis determines how I calculate the p-value. Now, whatever symbol is here in my alternative hypothesis has to be, um, we have to find that. So in this case, I would come down to the third line, and I would use this 
the criteria for mu not equal to some mu naught. So mu not equal to 100 means that I would use this method. So I have three different methods. So if, so if mu is um, not equal to mu naught, then um, I have two possibilities. If z is greater than zero, then I say two times the probability that z is greater than z observed. If z is negative, then I'll say two times the probability that z is less than z observed, because that means that our um, uh, uh, z-score, that means that x-bar is smaller than our mu naught. Okay, and here it means that x bar is greater than the mu naught. So, how we can des describe this more easily and so that it's more easily understood is let's assume that we had mu is greater than 100 and we had x bar equals, um, let's see, x bar is equal to um, 6 and we said sigma is equal to 12. Then z observed would equal x bar minus mu over sigma over the square root of n. And let's say n is equal to um, 49. Uh, let's not do that big. Let's say it's equal to uh, 30. Okay. So we plug in x bar is... Uh, I wrote x bar wrong, didn't I? It's 106. So x bar equals 106. And so we'd have 106 minus 100 over sigma, which is 12, divided by the square root. Let's do 36 instead of uh, 30. So n over divided by. Just making this messy, let me start over. 106 minus 100 divided by sigma, which is 12, which is divided by the square root of 36, which is 6. And so 12 divided by 6 will be 2. This is going to be 6 divided by 2 equals 3.0. Okay. So in this case, since I have a greater than sign, my p-value, I'll take z observed, and that is a 3, and I want to know this is my p-value, the probability that it's more extreme or further away from the mean than our z observed, okay? And that's what this says. I want to find out this, okay? If h not, oh, I'm sorry, if our alternative were mu is less than 100, then we would want, we'd plot whatever z observed is, and then we'd find the area that it's less than, less than, sorry, less than. This is greater than. Okay, so we've got my signs mixed up. So this is the probability that z is greater than z observed, okay? And this down here is the probability that z is less than z observed, okay? So if it's a one-sided test, in other words, if we have a greater than, uh, I'm sorry, that's less than or greater than sign, if we have one of those, it's called a one-sided test. It's also called a one-tail test. I'm not sure which the book uses. This down here is called a two-sided test or a two-tailed test. Oops. Okay. So if you see those expressions, two-tailed test, that means this. So when we... When we look at this, what we're saying is that we don't care if 
our, um, we just want to test that H naught is not equal to 100, say. We don't care uh, if mu is less than 100 or if mu is greater than 100. We just care about whether it's different. And to do that, we have to be far enough away so that um, we don't, again, we don't care which way. So if this was negative z observed and this is positive z observed, this would be one half the p-value up here, and this would be one half the p-value down here. So um, we want in the middle c. So what's left over is uh, we want at least c in the middle. So if at least c is in the middle, then we would have alpha over 2 over here, and we'd have alpha over 2 on this side. So when we're calculating the p-value for a not equal to, um, we're going to get either, if, it, if in this case, if uh, z observed was negative, we get the one-half the p-value over here. So we have to multiply it by 2. Okay? This is if z is negative. If z is positive, we would get one-half of the p-value over here, and so we'd have to multiply that by 2. And the same thing, this, I've been talking about whether sigma is known, but the same thing occurs if sigma is unknown, but we use a t distribution. I hope this will become more clear when we do the example. Now, if, so what I do is I write down the cr rejection criteria. If p-value is less than alpha, so if this is true, then we reject H0. It's only H0 that we talk about, okay? We never talk about accepting or rejecting the claim. That's not what we do. We're going to assume H0 is true unless we have uh, evidence to prove otherwise. And then we say we're going to re reject H0 in favor of H1, uh, but all we have to do is say reject H0. If the p-value is not less than alpha, so I could write this, let's see, yeah, I'm on the small one, okay. So if p-value is not less than alpha, this means that the p-value is greater than alpha, then we do not reject h naught. we fail to reject h naught, And then as I mentioned, the most important part, the conclusion. There, so this is the statement that I want you to write every time you do a hypothesis test. So there either is or is not sufficient evidence to support the claim. Remember that the claim is H1. So we reject or fail to reject H0 but when we do the conclusion, we talk about H1, the claim. So if we reject H0, we say there is sufficient evidence to support H1, which is the claim. And then we write out the claim, state the claim, number two, what we put in here, is the claim written out in words that everybody can understand because they haven't taken a statistics course. So you're communicating, think about communicating to your parents or your brother or sister or your best friend who hasn't had a statistics course. You wouldn't want to say, I rejected H naught. They wouldn't know what you were saying. So we would say there, let's say we did reject H0, then we'd say there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the mean IQ is different than 100 at a, and let's say we put 95% confidence level from a test with a simple random sample of size n, and I think we said on this one it was 36. So we need to fill in the blanks here, okay? So please write down this sentence and have it uh, ready 
it's a little different than what the book does, and this is what I want you to write to get full credit. So please, uh, please pay attention to this. All right? So sometimes the book is not terribly precise, and if you, some of you are going to go on and take more statistics courses, so I want everyone to learn to do this correctly. Well, that's the end of this video. Please remember to scan your lecture notes before midnight of the date listed on the course calendar. If you have questions, please come to virtual office hours. I am very happy to help you, as always. If you can't do that, then you're welcome to email me. But when you email me, I need two things from you. The first is a picture of the problem so that I can help you through email. I may not have the problem available to me. If you don't send me the problem, then you're going to have to wait until I get back to my computer and get that problem pulled up. So please send me a picture of the problem. The second thing you need to send me is a picture of your work so far. This helps me understand how you're approaching the problem and may help me or will help me uh, help you faster and better. So I hope you will stay safe and take care of yourself. Until next time, we'll see you then.